Great pleasure now, however, to uh, welcome our next guest, Chelsea Sexton, electric car advocate and advisor in California. Chelsea's electric transportation background includes working on General Motors EV1 program, serving as a director of the uh, Automotive X Prize, senior advisor for Vantage Point Capital Partners and co-founder uh, Plug-in America. She was also uh, featured in Who Killed the Electric Car and was a consulting producer on Revenge of the Electric Car. She knows a bit about that. What is it, 100-year-plus history of the electric car? Chelsea, uh, welcome. Hi. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Rather freeloader. That's available too. Okay. Thank you. Wow, Malcolm, you're not at all intimidating to follow. <laughs> My gosh, I feel like I belong at the kids' table after that. <laughs> so it took us about 20 years to hit the first million EVs on the road around the world, and it's estimated it'll take us about another 18 months to do the second million. Sort of a overnight success, a couple decades in the making. And that's very exciting, especially after many years of, of darkness and not a lot happening. But this is also not the first time that we've seen it. You know, in 1979, the cover of Motor Trend said, 20 electric cars you can buy today. This is a story we've been at for a while, hence the 100-year history. Uh, I started <laughs> 20 years ago as a 20-year-old bright, shiny kid on my first electric car program, the EV1, at a time where it felt very much like we feel today. The numbers are different, but the sense of deja vu is not insignificant, and it indicates a little bit of caution is probably still required. But we started off very enthusiastic, and we had some good years, and we had a handful of other automakers involved, and more uh, SUVs and electric pickup trucks than we did little tiny cars at the time, and all of them went at least 100 miles. But in the end, it didn't quite go so well because the automakers weren't as in as we had hoped. And so we did all sorts of things to try to raise awareness to the story and draw attention and try to change things. And we held a funeral as an absolute press stunt, thinking the media would come cover it and we could move on. And they did, but the way they covered it was EV drivers bid fun farewell to their electric cars and get ready for hydrogen fuel cells. And a couple of the drivers just went, oh my god, that is so not the story. And so uh, we did all sorts of things encouraging consumers to ask for what they want. Um, you know, I ended every presentation at the time with the email address of Bob Lutz, who was at the time a, an executive at General Motors, bob.lutz at gm.com. They would all write to him. He would respond. And then I would get a lot of people coming back to me going, oh my god, look at what he told me to go get a life. Um, <laughs> so it had some interesting mixed results, but we know for sure that the best way to get a car company to respond is actually indicate what it is you want to buy. But we also did what you do when you're frustrated and from Los Angeles and no one will tell your story, and we made a movie. Um, we thought we would burn copies for our parents and move on with our lives. <laughs> it didn't quite go that way. Uh, it, we also worked on it for five years under the impression that I would not be in it at all. I saw a rough cut where that was true and then went to Sundance and had my husband sitting next to me going, your head is so big. Um, so it's been an interesting ride out of the frying pan into the fire. But as we were running around with this little movie, I got a phone call while standing on a street corner in Minneapolis. And the, press, the reporter said to me, I just want to know what you think about General Motors doing another electric car again. And this was about May 2006, and I might have suggested that she lay off the hard drugs. <laughs> but, you know, a few months later, GM actually did unveil the Chevrolet Volt. And it was a heady time, and we had, you know, GM had asked us to come over, and so we went to the Detroit Auto Show with a camera just in case, uh, but without a lot of actual faith. And Bob Lutz got up on the stage and unveiled that car. And then that night, he came to me and said, can you please get your people to stop emailing me now? <laughs> And his daughter overheard and pulled me aside. She said, don't you dare, because you have no idea how much those people changed my father's mind. Now, we're closing in on a half million cars in California. I mean, in, in the United States, about 40% of those are in California. Uh, less than 1% market share nationwide. In California, it's more like 3%. But there's also some subsections. So among subcompacts and small cars, it's a much higher segment. Obviously, we don't really have SUVs and trucks yet. We don't even have the Outlanders. So you guys are first <laughs> before us. We'll get it sometime next year now. It's been delayed again. Uh, but we have about 3 quarters of our sales are leased two or three years generally, and that's in part because you know people know the technology is emerging and they won't, don't want to be locked into something. It's also because the structure of our federal tax credit really encourages leasing. 
Two thirds are also what are called conquest sales. So somebody that's brand new to a particular brand, buying a Chevy for the first time or a BMW for the first time, which the automakers do see as a fairly incredible opportunity. And as Malcolm suggested, battery price is coming down. Bloomberg thinks it's more like 2022 versus 2018, but somewhere in that ballpark. And that by around 2040, EVs will be about 35% of sales around the world. All of which will be awesome if it happens. <laughs> However, <laughs> what I see way too much of right now is complacency. Way too much. It's a rolling snowball that can't be stopped and everybody's all in. And that's just really not the case. One of the main drivers in the United States is policy, both carrots and sticks. Uh, so our federal policy uh, cafe, in terms of uh, average fuel economy, 54 mi 54.5 miles per gallon by 2025 is a big bogey for the auto manufacturers. And then, of course, for anybody that did see the first little movie, that carbs ev program still exists. It always has. It's come and gone and been watered down in different things, but it's still it's it's a bit more powerful now. And there are currently 10 states that follow that particular program. However, there is a very active lobbying effort to dumb down both of those policies, as well as the CO2 regulations in Europe. So all of this is still very dependent on three pieces of policy that if any of them changed, the picture of electric cars and the promise for 2018 is very, very different. So having worked inside a bunch of those automakers, still working with many of those automakers, I'm not quite as optimistic as Malcolm in terms of they've changed everything in the last two months. Although certainly, and especially among the European manufacturers, diesel has been a giant factor in that. So the last eight months to a year has very much changed their attitude in that regard. But there's still a lot left to do. On the carrot side, we have a lovely federal tax credit of about 10,500 New Zealand dollars. And a bunch of our states have different levels of incentives. Some forgive tax, some write a check. Um, the challenge with all of them is a lack of awareness. Even in California, sort of the biggest market area of the United States, only 17% of people are aware that we even had a state tax credit. That's kind of still a problem. Plus, budgets keep running out. Georgia had a huge tax incentive that went away suddenly in July. So that up, again, up, up and down aspect of it makes dealers not want to talk about it, creates a lot of confusion for consumers. And so you know, the lack of stability is a major challenge, certainly in the United States. And then we have a bunch of psychological incentives. And those have always been the most powerful ones we've ever had. <laughs> um, minister mentioned that HOV lanes are the single most powerful thing. They absolutely have been. I was thrilled to hear him say that. I'm thrilled that, to see the bus lanes in the announcement. I know that there's been a lot of angst about it. I've read all the responses. I would say that there are nuances. Certainly, you have to be careful how you do it, how you implement it. We have, in some cases, made some mistakes in terms of not having minimum efficiency standards for HOV lanes for plug-in hybrids. If it has a plug, it comes in, which means that there's a lot of like nine-mile plug-in Priuses in our HOV lanes. So I wouldn't say that just because California did it a certain way that it's the way to be done, but there certainly are some opportunities there. And then there are other ones that are sort of low financial, free parking at parking meters, and we have free parking in a couple of airports and things. And it's, yes, people save a little bit of money, but it's more the psychological aspect. The incentives that offer time, access, convenience, privilege are far more powerful in, in our case than the money has been in the early years. And in, in I would wager that we actually rolled out the money way too soon, that it has a place, but the early adopters will take the money, but they didn't need the money to make that decision. Infrastructure is obviously a very, very hot topic. Um, it's a bit of a wild west of different connector standards, but also just a variety of different networks and companies involved. In the US, we have a unique, so, somewhat unique problem of having to be a member of eight different networks just to drive anywhere, because every one of them requires a different key fob. And so while five years ago, the conversation was more charging at any cost, you know, faster is always better, now the current conversation is very much around reliability and interoperability. But it also has as much of a psychological uh, aspect to it as it does a substantive one. About 67% of tes current Tesla Model S owners said that having that supercharger network there was a huge factor in them being willing to get the car in the first place. And we know that's equally true for other buyers of other brands. But it's also not just faster is better. There's a place for level two charging, sort of seven kilowatt like phone boxes, <laughs> as well as, you know, speeds in between. So we have everything in the US from very, very slow 120 volt charging four miles per hour in terms of range all the way up to coming 150 next year. By far though, 
The single biggest problem is not battery cost, it's not lack of infrastructure, it is lack of product, even in the US, especially in Europe and even more so here. Uh, you know, all the cars listed at the top are, are not even all of them anymore, available in the United States. Yes, I know there are 45 cars coming in the next few years. However, <laughs> we have a huge problem with compliance cars. Um, because of those states that have mandates, we have a few automakers that are kind of sincerely in. Tesla, GM, Nissan, a few of those. The vast majority of them are building as few as they have to and putting them only in the places they have to while they simultaneously lobby to try to get rid of some of those policies and, and make their programs go away. So there are lots of types of cars, but there are few of each of them. And while we have about 20 different cars available in California, there are only four or five that are available truly nationwide in the US, even as one of the larger market areas. They're all good cars. I mean, there's no bad plug-in car out there. There are different ones. I like some better than others, but there's none that you kind of go, oh, I'm so sorry you bought that. But no matter how good any of them are, if there's only a couple to choose from, sales will always stay fairly low. There's no single petrol car on the road today that's the car for everyone. The same is absolutely true for EVs. And then there's the market. <laughs> we were talking about supply versus demand. We're in a unique situation here. We always have been. EVs are the only case in automotive history where the industry has always said, when we see demand, we will build cars. That hasn't existed for hybrids or hydrogen cars or SUVs or retail products in general. Apple doesn't build an iPhone only after you ask for it. And that is one of our problems because not all of you are old enough to remember a Walkman, <laughs> but I am. <laughs> and none of us looked at that 30 years ago and said, I wish this was smaller than a deck of cards and I could watch TV on it and make a phone call and order a pizza. But that's exactly what the auto industry is expecting consumers to do now is ask for electric cars that many of whom don't even know are possible. It's the number one thing I have heard in the last 10 years running around since that movie was made. I didn't know electric cars were possible. And as long as that remains true, we're kind of up a creek. There's also a bit of a problem with actual marketing. <laughs> um, the one on the top left is a Volt ad, which I found kind of interesting. It was, it was meant to promote the fact that you can go in the HOV lane and therefore you can get rid of your mannequin that you keep in your passenger seat. But <laughs> considering that EV drivers have always been nerdy enough to have, you know, be considered to need artificial companionship, I'm not sure it was the best ad. <laughs> On the other hand, a couple of years ago, they made an ad for the Super Bowl about the Camaro, and the premise of it was basically the, the parent said to the kid, you know, he's graduating from college, your presence out on the front lawn, and he goes out, the, out there and he sees the Camaro, and he just, he goes absolutely ape, and you know, obviously jumping up and down, he's so excited, and his present was really the refrigerator on the front lawn. But it's such an indication of how emotional vehicle purchases are, whatever they are, it's the second biggest purchase we'll ever make in life, and it's primarily an emotional one. We buy emotionally, we justify rationally. And as GM ran around surveying their, their EV drivers, their Volt drivers, about what they liked about the car, the number one thing they came back with was they're fun to drive. And even without making the Camaro move, it's so clear from that one ad that that is the implication. And so I called GM and I sort of said, you know, what's the deal here? You guys know that fun to drive is one of the favorite features. And the guy I was talking to, who really is an EV guy, he loves he loved the Volt like I love EV1 or anything else, he said, how would you portray fun to drive in 30 seconds? I said, isn't that what you do for a living? So it's really interesting that the industry that specializes in this struggles so much to figure out how to talk about plug-in cars to its market. And a lot of it is this fear that people are going to be afraid of electric cars, that they're different and they're alien and they're foreign and that we have to somehow dumb them down and make them seem familiar and safe. And so we strip all of the emotion out of them, which is fine, except that no one waxes lyrical about their Maytag refrigerator. <laughs> they do about their car, and that's what we have to inject back into the marketing and advocacy experience. So what we've ended up with instead is a lot of fan-generated content. The top left is a still shot from, a, from an ad that a Tesla driver made about his Tesla. The bottom right is something that just recently happened. <laughs> it became kind of interesting. A guy who has a, a Chevy Volt and a Chevy Spark, so two different EVs in America, decided that he'd also really like something sportier. And so he made an actual website around introducing this, this faux 20, 2018 Chevy Jolt based on an old GM concept car. 
And within three hours, it was in Motor Trend and Car and Driver and Fortune and Forbes, <laughs> because none of them realized whether it was real or not. It was that compelling a website. <laughs> and then even after they figured out it wasn't real, they just thought it was awesome. GM, on the other hand, did not think it was quite so awesome. <laughs> I got some very interesting phone calls in the coming days. <laughs> so that also leaves us to recognize the role of the actual drivers and advocates and movement. Um, in the US, we say it takes a driver to make a driver. I mean, the single most effective tool we will have are the EV drivers themselves. I had the pleasure of being down here in April for uh, the Leading the Charge Road Tour. And it was incredible, and it reinforced the fact that the communities here are no different than anywhere else in the world, and that your single biggest asset in this country to try to put electric cars on the road are the existing advocates and drivers. For one thing, there are far more of them than there will ever be of us, and that will become increasingly true. But they are also the experts. They answer these questions 100 times a day, and they are better at it than the, those who work in the industry ever will be. So while we have a tendency to really kind of stick to the industry side and the, for the formal official people, we have to figure out how to better engage and better leverage the driving communities and let them help because they uniquely want to. Nobody who buys a, a gas or a diesel car thinks they're voting for the success of that technology. Every EV driver feels like, to some degree, they are helping to co-create the success of electric vehicles. And that's important, and it's an opportunity, and shame on all of us if we don't do better with it. So <laughs> for the first duty of revolution is to get away with it. In some ways, it feels like that's what we're embarking upon, although had anyone told me 20 years ago that's what it would be, I would never have signed up. <laughs> and I think we're still trying to get away with it a little bit. But as we'll come up 18 times today, Tesla's obviously one of those indications. Um, it's the first startup I've seen in 20 years that actually looked promising. There's been one or two others. Uh, they've, they're rounding 100,000 sales. Obviously, there's 400,000 Model 3 orders. Best thing ever when Elon said, I was inspired by the passion for EV1. Our little 800 cars <laughs> in our goofy little movie and our protests are part of what helped even put Tesla on the map. So it doesn't always seem like some of your actions are, are all that impactful compared to this. However, it all is part of a contribution. This is one of my favorite images. Um, I am dorky enough that I still look through the front window of every EV I pass on the road. Because for a very long time, I knew every driver behind the wheel. And to some degree, I still expect to. <laughs> The, um, the, the image is actually, we opened up the paper, the Washington Post, back during the first Obama inauguration. And while he was taking the train up to DC to be inaugurated, th there was a snapshot of pictures along the way. And this is one of them. And the most remarkable thing about it, the reason we were so excited, was we had no freaking clue who these people were. <laughs> because we were so used to going from orchestrating everything to all of a sudden, there's a whole bunch more people involved in all of this. And we kind of were like, who are they, and dug into it. And it turned out that they were a group of people from Delaware whose, whose Chrysler plant had just closed. And they were really wanting to see it open back up and made, make EVs. And it's been kind of a similar experience here. I first came down here in 2008. And it was a very small group, and we were all sort of a bunch of friends. And you know, it's not a lot happened for a little while. And now to come back in April and back here again, I feel like I'm very quickly becoming <laughs> part of the Kiwi family. Um, but it's really heartening to see so many co-conspirators that are here <coughs> that I don't know, that I'm excited to know, but that while there's so much to be done, there's now so much potential and so many more people being willing. And it is exactly that will to do it and the willingness to address the complexities of all these things that will, that will finish that revolution. So thank you for letting me be here. Thank you.